India is on track to become the world's epicenter for the coronavirus after reporting the highest single day increase in COVID-19 infections for a second day in a row worldwide. The country tracked more than 332,000 new cases yesterday, about 20,000 more cases than what was reported the day before. For more on this, let's bring in Jeffrey Gettleman. He's the South Asia Bureau Chief for The New York Times. Um, Jeffrey, India's COVID caseload plummeted to record lows in February. There are a lot of uh, organizations, newspapers, media outlets that were sort of applauding what was happening in India. Two months later, we're at a record high. What happened? It's a really good question. Um, there was a sense of false confidence here. I, I saw it myself. I'm, I'm speaking to you from New Delhi, and I had traveled a lot in the last you know, six months. And a few months ago, there was this idea that the pandemic was finished, that India had beat it. Um, I remember traveling through parts of central India, driving through villages and towns, not seeing a single person wearing a mask. People were huddled together, no sense of social distancing, very little interest in getting the vaccine. And there was this, this collective feeling that we've got this, we've beat this. Um, that was just a, a real mistake. You know, what we're seeing now is this runaway curve of the fastest growing coronavirus problem the world has seen anywhere. 330,000 cases, new cases a day. And this is in a country that does fewer tests than in the U.S. or in the Western nations of, of Europe. Um, so, so that's just a small fraction of what's really happening there. And we also have evidence that the death rate and the number of people who are dying from COVID in India is way higher than is being officially reported. Um, so it's just very terrifying to live in the city. I have so many friends who have gotten sick, people around me, my neighbors, people I work with. That didn't happen during the first wave. Um, we're, we've been told to stay indoors, like there's this poison gas outside that we shouldn't inhale. I, there's just a real sense of, of, of fear and, and helplessness that you can't do anything to prevent yourself from getting sick. And then in the midst of this massive surge, you know, I've heard stories of just like really bad hiccups, hospitals running out of oxygen. So, you know, patients are, are, are dying, a, a fire at, at a hospital. Um, and, the, and the vaccine rollout has not been so great. India is home to the world's largest vaccine maker, uh, the Serum Institute of India. It produces 60% of the world's vaccines each year, including the AstraZeneca shot. But I think I saw that the vaccination rate was 2% or it's in the single digits in India. What's going on with that? No, no, it's a really good point you raise. Um, India is the world's largest manufacturer of vaccines. They supply vaccines to countries all around um, the world at very cheap prices. They have these enormous manufacturing facilities like the Serum Institute that you mentioned. There was this sense that people didn't need the vaccine. There just wasn't a lot of interest in it. Um, now that this surge is happening and there's this, you know, fear spreading across the country, there's not enough of the vaccine to go around. And even though India has produced uh, millions of doses, we're talking about a country that has a population of 1.4 billion people. That's bigger than Europe and the U.S. combined. So how do you vaccinate a, a population that big this fast? and they're struggling. And this oxygen issue is becoming a real alarming crisis that a lot of people who get sick with COVID need oxygen. Either they need to be put on a ventilator or they need a high flow of oxygen or just oxygen support to breathe. And the country's running out of oxygen. And India is a major industrial player in the world. It's one of the largest economies in the world. There are factories everywhere, tens of millions of workers. It has a lot of industrial firepower. So it just seems like this is a question of mismanagement and not anticipating the second wave. If you look around the world and you see how the second wave has, has hit other countries, it's, it's always higher than the first wave and many more people get sick. And so that's what we're seeing now in India. There's just, there's just this sense that there may not be the resources to throw at this at this moment as these cases are spiking. And it's really scary. I mean, just to be honest, it's scary to be in a place where the hospitals are over overflowing. People are dying from from unnecessary things like running out of oxygen or not seeing a doctor. 
and it's highly contagious. I mean, one other point I should make, and I don't mean just to be the purveyor of bad news endlessly, but this is a, this is a serious topic, is there could be a new variant in India that combines mutations of other variants that's making this, this round of the virus even more contagious and possibly evasive of the vaccines. So that's, that's scaring people, that maybe there's something different in India that could spread outside of India that, that we're just learning about right now. Yeah, Jeffrey, no, it, it is a serious topic, and it's one that has significant implications for people in the world's second most populous country. Um, the sheer volume of COVID-related deaths is staggering. I mean, let's look at this video. Let's show our audience this video of mass cremation sites. This is horrific. Um, explain, you know, one of the things that we're starting to see here in the United States is the survivors, right? The people who lost loved ones, family members, colleagues, neighbors to COVID-19, but now have to carry on as we start to emerge from the pandemic slightly here in the U.S. You know, my heart goes out to those that are still, you know, have that empty hole in their heart. So I, I, it's got to be even more devastating in India because at least in the United States, we never saw images like that. So cremations are a very important ritual in Hinduism. I, India is 80% Hindu. And, and part of the belief of cremation is that it releases your soul from your body. And people take cremation very seriously. Um, what we're seeing now around the country is that these cremation grounds are, are overflowing. There are people waiting hours with the bodies of their loved ones to, to burn them. And one cremation site in Western India, the, the, the grills used to burn the bodies were getting so hot that they actually melted because they, weren't, they were being used relentlessly around the clock. And we're, what, what we're finding, what we're doing research for, and we're going to have a story about it soon, is that there's a disconnect between the numbers of people who are being cremated, who likely died of COVID, and what government authorities are reporting as the death toll. And so it seems like the real mm. death toll is much higher than the official death toll, which is already very high, over 2,000 people dying every day. Of course, you know the challenge that India is dealing with, but it's probably exaggerated in India um, versus every other country, is the economic impact. The, India was really good in sort of the first round uh, of the pandemic. There was a nationwide lockdown, um, and there was a lot of praise. You point out now that there, you're in the middle of another lockdown, that it almost feels like there's a toxic gas outside. They just want everyone to stay inside. But there are others within um, you know, Indian politics that are warning lockdowns need to be the last resort because this country cannot take the economic fallout of another mass lockdown. Can you just talk about the impact that the first lockdown had on the Indian economy and what, what the concerns are? Yeah, no, no, this is like the big question, like whether to do a lockdown or not. India is different from, from, from Western countries in, in the sense that it's much poorer. The per capita income in India is like $2,000 uh, per person on average. In the U.S., it's, it's 60000 Many people in India need to work to survive. They live in big cities. They work as, as, as cleaners, as street sweepers, as rickshaw drivers, behind the scenes at a restaurant, in a factory, low-skilled jobs, making a few dollars a day. And if they don't work, they have no money to buy food. They have no money to feed their family. They have no way to survive. So if you just shut down the entire economy, you put tens of millions of people out of work and there's not a social safety net to, to feed them. So that's the concern in India. People can't work from home. If you tell some guy in the street, hey, would you like to work from home? That's like a dream come true for him. You know, some of us complain about sort of mixing our, our family lives with our work lives and doing this balance. But for so many people in this country, they can't do that. They work on the streets. They work in these huge industrial places. And so the concern is if you, if you put the brakes on the economy, you're going to create devastating pain for many, many people. And the government is trying to do everything but that. They did it before. It caused enormous economic wreckage. But if the cases are rising so fast and so many people are getting sick, one way to slow down the spread is to ask everybody to stay inside and to police the streets and to mandate that. So we're beginning to see a combination. Some places are locked down, some places aren't. But 
the, the expectation is if this gets really bad, they're going to have to lock down India again. And we saw how, how, how horrible that was for so many people, but maybe it saved lives. We, we, we were really like sort of struggling with that balance here right now. And Jeff, you've reported uh, uh, how major outbreaks in major cities are prompting people in India to uh, migrate and seek some work in rural areas. Help us understand the overall impact of this exodus. Yeah, no, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, it's kind of complicated. The, the, there's a lot of people in India that live in cities and work in cities, but they're not native to cities. They've migrated over the years from villages and different parts of the country because there's more opportunities in cities. So when this first lockdown happened, lots of people left. They, they went on the highways, they went on the railway tracks, they went taking trucks and whatever way they could to get back to the rural villages just to be with their families and survive on a farm or in a, in a country setting where the cost of living was much cheaper. Now that these lockdowns are happening, this is beginning to, to, to reinvigorate that, that migration, that, that pouring of people out from the cities. The problem is, there's like two big problems. The problem is one, economically, that's really bad for the country because those people were working in the cities and when they leave, you can't get these factories started or the industries back on their feet unless you have all those workers. So if they're scattered across the country, there's a delay when things are over to bring them back. But the, the, more, the bigger problem is it spreads the virus. These, these migrant laborers are leaving these hot spots like Mumbai, like Delhi, like cities in Western India, and they're going to these rural areas and they're most likely carrying the virus. And we saw that happen last time and that's happening again. So we have the virus concentrated in cities like Delhi where I live right now and soon you're gonna see hot spots popping up across the country as migrant laborers return to every, every corner of India. And I imagine if the hospitals in the cities are buckling under the pressure, whatever medical facilities are available in these more rural areas must, must be wholly inadequate to deal with that. That's it. I mean, India is like a real land of contrast. I mean, there are some beautiful places here and really fancy offices and office buildings and, you know, the, the top notch technology um, and, and, and stunning hotels. Um, but then there's hundreds of millions of people that are deeply impoverished. And so what kind of medical care will they get if in the cities they're already, you know, stressed? Um, people here are resilient, though, and, and, the, and the average age of, of India is, you know, less than 30 compared to the U.S., which is like in the 40s or 50s, uh, and in, you know, Europe it's the same. So, so the deaths in, in a place like India have been less per capita than in many other places. Um, but the healthcare system is, is, is just really stressed. I mean, you see these images of people waiting in line for, to just get into a hospital, and sometimes they're dying in line, and sometimes they're dying in the back of ambulances that are driving around frantically, a city like New Delhi trying to find a hospital to take a patient, and they don't find a hospital in time, and the person dies in the back of the ambulance while they're looking. Um, and then we've had some accidents of, you know, there was a case a couple of days ago where a hospital was getting its oxygen tank refilled and there was a mishap and the tank started leaking. Oxygen flow gets cut off to dozens of people in an intensive care unit and 25 die. So this, this country feels very um, scared right now. And there's a huge effort to get the resources in place. But we're gonna we're gonna bear a heavy a heavy brunt of this virus wave in the next you know few days few weeks, and that's you know it seems like there's nothing we can do to stop it, and that's why everybody's kind of retreating inside and and doing what they can to just not get sick. Like that's 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 a real fear that a lot of us feel. Uh, I'm sorry, well, it's just Jeffrey like Gettleman, one, thanks one, for joining I, us. One bad, no, one, and one, but one, I like, think it's a very good. <laughs> I think it's a good reminder that we are dealing with a global pandemic. You know, here in the U.S., we can pat ourselves on the back on how the vaccine rollout's going, how many people are getting their first shot and their second shot, but we will never be fully protected unless the rest of the world is as well. I mean, you talk about the development of variants in India and, and sort of variants upon variants that we don't even know about here in the U.S. yet, 
but there's no way to contain it. So, you know, it's sort of incumbent on every nation to help each other out to, to get out of this situation, you know? So I think it's very important for people to hear what the situation is like um, in India, Jeffrey. And I hope you stay safe and healthy, stay indoors. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. My pleasure. Thank you.